Hello everyone, uh, my name is Daisy Chavra. I come from, from Perth, Western Australia, from the School uh, of Surgery, University of Western Australia and Fiona Stanley Hospital. What I'm going to be talking today is about cochlear implantation in single site deafness with a special focus on mapping and rehabilitation for this population. So what we are going to be covering in this um, lecture is reviewing the protocol, um, the current research re results and as I said the rehabilitation and mapping optimization. So let's go back to history. So how everything is started with uh, cochlear implant in single side deafness. If we go back, uh, we are celebrating in 2018 15 years of the use of cochlear implant in single side deafness. But everything is started as actually a tinnitus treatment, not a hearing treatment. And the first publication by the Belgian group uh, was very positive, showing the results uh, of cochlear implant in the tinnitus treatment um, in single side deafness. Of course, what they was found was that the results were not only positive for tinnitus management but for hearing outcomes as well. And we have the first paper published by the same group in 2009. And as, as expected, as a new field, uh, several uh, papers were published along the years and here you just have a very quick shot of what was published, a few of the papers published. What happened for the last um, 10 years now of publications is the fact that every single group was looking at the results, the benefits of cochlear implant in single side deafness, but everyone was doing things slightly differently, using different protocols, different testing um, framework. So the experts from the hearing group working with single side deafness uh, gathered together uh, in two meetings, 2015 and 2016, working uh, to develop a unified, unified testing framework for single side deafness. Uh, so this paper was published back in 2016 and the purpose of this work was to increase the evidence, to be able to gather the data together from different centers uh, to increase the evidence of the, the cochlear implant in single side deafness. So based on this consensus paper, the current protocol that we are using, we implemented since the, the publication of the consensus uh, manuscript, we use what was agreed by the group is that to show um, an improvement in terms of his speech understanding, what was proposed is the spatial configurations that we can see on these slides, on this slide showing trying to measure the binaural benefits, including head shadow, square sh and summation. We, if we are implanting patients with single side deafness, what we are trying to achieve is binaural hearing. So it's just fair that we try to measure binaural hearing. One of the main um, issues that patients with single side deafness report is the lack of ability to localize where the sound is coming from. So it was also agreed by the group that sound localization should be part of the assessment and evaluation protocol. In addition, quality of life questionnaires, tinnitus reduction for those who have tinnitus, and it was also agreed by the group that the rehabilitation process should be part of the discussion with the patients and should be a very strong point to defend. So in this slide what I'm showing is the long-term results in terms of speech understanding and noise in three different spatial configurations. So this, in this left here where you are seeing the results of uh, CI off, CI on in the signal and noise coming from front. So the results are represented in dB signal to noise ratio, which means that lower the number, the better the result. 
This is the configuration where the sound is coming from front and noise is coming from the hearing ear and again you see a very clear benefit from the implant situation. In this third column here on the right, what we are seeing is probably the most challenging situation for patients with single side deafness is when the speech is coming from the deaf side and the noise is coming from the hearing ear. Just remember that this is long-term data results which confirm um, the results that we have achieved um, and published through the last few years. In terms of uh, quality of life improvement, these are the long-term results as well. Uh, looking at the speech, spatial and quality of hearing, the simplified version uh, using only 12 questions. And what we have is the pre-op results and the long-term results. There is a significant improvement, subjectively speaking. In terms of localization, again, we see a significant improvement from the CI off condition to the CI on condition. We can see that the mean was around 52 uh, RMS arrow degrees with the CI off down to approximately 18 degrees. But I'd like to focus on the rehabilitation uh, program that we follow. And from the conversations with different groups, uh, different experts through the world, it looks like that we have uh, agreed that rehabilitation starts at the CI assessment. These patients, they have a strong uh, counseling uh, interview discussing the intensive rehab, intensive rehabilitation program that they are going to need to follow post-implantation. Another topic that we take very seriously in our center is that expectations um, and the understanding that the sound coming from the implant side will be different to the normal hearing ear to such extent and for a certain period. We cannot guarantee how long it's going to take for the sound to integrate to the normal ear and how long it's going to take to uh, perceive the implant as more natural as it could be. In our center, to avoid mistakes, misunderstandings, we do ask the patient to sign a consent, um, at least that telling us that they are aware that there is, we, we would like them to be uh, committed to the rehab program, that we would like them to be wearing this sound processor all waking hours to avoid a delay in the process of rehabilitation. We also ask them to commit 20 to 30 minutes of uh, practice using direct audio input. The reason for that is that patients with single side deafness what we learned for the last 10 12 years is that they need an active uh, training. They cannot, they will not benefit from the CI if we use uh, passive learning, that's how I would call, as we, as we have been using through the years with the conventional implant. If we don't uh, is stimulate this patient, don't ask them to actually stimulate the implant of the ear, the, pre the preference for the good hearing ear will be present. So we do ask them to use the direct audio input through the cable if possible, if we're using wireless system, but it has to be direct audio input to stimulate the ear um, using the implant. So how do we do that? At switch on, which occurs approximately two to three weeks maximum per surgery, we perform the MCL's measurement as, uh, as with uh, conventional uh, cochlear implant users. And what we try very hard to do is to balance the loudness between the implanted ear and the normal ear to avoid to create an asymmetry where the implanted ear is still softer than the normal hearing ear or the other way around. The implanted ear is too loud compared with the normal hearing ear. 
We do include fine structure processing, if possible, and we use the widest frequency range. The reason for that is um, there is an increase in acceptance of the sound. Remember that the single side deafness patient, they are comparing uh, an electrical input to a normal acoustic hearing. So if we can make this sound as more natural as possible, we have better chance that these patients will uh, persevere using the implant and will achieve that the benefits that they are looking for. In the second mapping session, which occurs a week later, uh, we adjust the MCLs to ensure audibility and again making sure that we have a binaural balance. And at this session, we also create a dedicated map for auditory training through the direct audio input. Why am I calling this dedicated map? It's because through the last decade uh, what we have learned is that on average patient needs uh, an increase in MCLs uh, to be able to hear clear speech through the direct audio input. Usually the map for the direct uh, audio input is on average at least 6 to 12 percent louder than the average map that they use throughout the day. This, the reason is very simple. If they are hearing through the implant alone, uh, they need a little bit of more power. That's how I would put it. And of course, we'll, there is an impedance going through this uh, cable, if it is a cable. So we do increase uh, the MCLs for this map. When they are not using the wireless system or the cable, what they need is relatively slower, lower MCLs because in this situation they are using binaural hearing and they need less um, stimulation. So we use uh, the direct audio input, the cable, or we also use the Bluetooth streaming. Another um, Another way that we use to keep the patient engaged is actually asking them to keep a, a log, a diary, actually telling, recording uh, the hearing activities that they are doing and actually trying to identify the sounds that they cannot hear well or they cannot hear at all or they find that the sound is confusing or unclear. The reason why we do this is because we use this information to fine-tune the map. Because if we know which sounds they are not hearing, they are struggling to understand during the, the training sessions, we are able to fine-tune the map in that specific area of stimulation and optimize it as soon as possible. Another aspect that we believe that are very important to keep the patients engaged is to tailor to the each individual needs. So how do we do that? We use, we use different materials. We try with the patient to identify materials that are uh, that means something for the patient. We don't really specify you have to go through this material in particular, but we try to work with them, uh, which is interesting for them. So if they like books, we do, we do use audiobooks. If they like uh, videos, small videos, documentaries, uh, that's what we are going to be using. If there is a subject that is the special interest, particularly for the younger um, kids and uh, teenagers, that's what we try to, to find with them, things that will keep them motivated and engaged in the rehab program. So at the very early stage, we try to make sure that they are able to identify phonemes. Uh, we go through very basic environmental sounds, speech identification, just to make sure that these tasks are very clear for them. And then we move uh, forward to a more complex listening. We include 
uh, as I said previously, we include videos uh, where it's just one person talking. We do ask them not to use uh, movies where there is a variety of uh, sound source. Usually we ask them to use a simple video where it's one person talking clear um, and direct. Uh, another benefit is that you can uh, look for videos that is in the first language, the person's first language, uh, take into account um, accent and other aspects. So in the third mapping session, we go through fine tuning map, the map if it's required. Um, we make sure that the patient has understand uh, the use of the direct audio input that he, uh, the patient is able to access all the, access, uh, the online exercise, the rehab software, if everything is going well for them. In the fourth week post activation, which is around a six weeks month, or six weeks post activation, we perform an optimization of the map. We have learned through the years that with the single side deafness, if we are able to provide a good outcome at very early on, we are in better position to keep these patients engaged in using the sound processor. Because they are not totally deaf, they have different expectations. If they take too long to obtain the results that they are looking for, we, we believe that they tend to um, give up the sound processor soon, sooner, let's put it this way. So what we, in our center, what we decided is to make sure that these patients actually can see the benefit of the implant at very early on and get used to the sound processor very early on. So what we have been using for the last three to four years, using the cortical auditory responses to measure what the patient is uh, detecting with the sound processor and we use it as a tool to fine-tune the process, the, the sound processor. So that's the setup that we use. We use uh, the, a system that's a two-channel, very simple, that's available um, to the clinics and we use the four speech tokens to give us an idea which area of the speech spectrum the patient is hearing or is not hearing. So we present the four speech, speech tokens, uh, the M, T, G and S. So if there is any of these sounds that the patient cannot hear or the cortical auditory response is not clear to us, uh, we fine tune the map in that specific region. So. So it's just an extra tool to make sure that actually we are able to optimize this implant, ensure that the patient is hearing the whole speech spectrum at a very early stage. So we perform these measures, as I said before, uh, at four weeks post switch on. So we have published the results of uh, this study recently and we also um, looked at two specific population within this study is the question that several people around the world um, have made is deafness duration an issue for single side deafness as it can be for conventional um, uh, bilateral deafness. So what we found within our group is that we could measure the cortical auditory uh, responses in patients with up to 40 years of deafness duration. So these patients, they are full-time wearers, they, are, they have long-term experience with CI, so we cannot say how long it would take for them to get these nice cortical responses, but we can say that at this stage, after chronic stimulation, they are, we have a nice cortical response for them. They are full-time wearers, which means that they are very well adjusted to the implant and all the objective measures in terms of speech, understanding and localization are also uh, confirming the results. So also using the cortical um, 
responses, we looked at the early onset of deafness. And that is a cohort that we agree that uh, we still don't have enough data to, to say that this population should receive a cochlear implant, but in, it's increasing the number of patients who come looking for a treatment and they have lost their hearing at a very early age. So we confirmed that the duration of deafness was not a parameter that we could use to say that these patients are not a candidate, but what for a cochlear implantation? But what about those who actually are adults looking for a treatment, but they lost the hearing at a very early age? So we have recently published this in the new report, and these are some of the results that we use the cortical again to confirm if these patients could detect the sound well. So that's an example of a patient that lost the hearing at the age of six and, and this is the cortical response. Again, uh, localization and uh, his speech understanding uh, was performed and we confirmed that that is a good outcome. That's another young adult uh, who lost their hearing again at the age of approximately six and this is the cortical response for, for this person. Going back to the rehabilitation, that is the setup that we use. So we use in the clinic if the patient doesn't have the uh, availability of material or hardware or software at home, we uh, invite them to come to our clinic and this is the setup that we use. So we can see that we use a laptop or iPad uh, to assess online materials and we have the ability, if we are working with children, we have the ability to split the signal and listen to the same uh, sound that the patient is hearing. I find this quite useful uh, when the patient is telling me that the sounds that they cannot hear, I can see for, by myself which are the mistakes that they are doing, which phonemes they are mixing up with each other. This gives me information which uh, electrode or electrode band that I would need to be uh, fine-tuning for better outcome. So as I said before, we use um, several online materials but we also use recorded voice of a family member. Uh, how do we do that? Very simple, we ask uh, a family member to read a page of a book for us, for example, and we record it using telephone or iPad or whatever is av available. Um, the, we particularly use this type of a training if the person has a long deafness duration because as anybody would expect these patients they will struggle to understand this speech uh, through the direct audio input unless you are using something that is familiar to them so we start with a very simple material such as can you record numbers in different orders can you just record colors or fruits or open questions can you just read uh, a page of a book for us with this type of approach, we eliminate the difficulty with, with uh, accent, for example. And because it's a family member, usually the, the patient find much easier to understand. So if they are not able to, for example, they are really struggling, if they report that they cannot, they hear the noise, they cannot make up what they are hearing with the conventional uh, online material, we usually use recorded, um, recorded material with the family. Or even with the own patient. Few times we have used, for example, we ask the patient himself or herself to record themselves reading and then uh, listen to it again. Uh, we find it very effective, particularly with those who are struggling at the beginning. Um, Another strategy that we use is that very early we ask them to use visual cues, so to 
watch a documentary, for example, with, uh, uh, with a vision, with reading, uh, with subtitles. So they are learning uh, at the same time. What we, uh, what we explain to the patient that to sit there and listen to something that you are not understanding at all uh, is not going to help, it, help you to progress forward because you are actually not learning to recognize the sound. So we use visual cues uh, for the first few sessions and then once they are ready, they feel comfortable, they are understanding more and more of this, uh, this sound, we, we remove the visual cues. We find that online materials are used to teach um, free materials, of course, used to teach English as a second language, very helpful, particularly because they are very well, the pronunciation is very clear and we use them particularly to emphasize the difference between sounds that are very similar to each other. As I said before, we use a short documentary, uh, particularly of topics um, that the patient enjoys, and we use it with and without subtitles. Audiobooks, at when the patient is ready, when the patient is already uh, understanding his speech, so through the, 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 the direct audio input training, we use audiobooks. We try, if possible, use audiobooks that are recorded using a slower uh, reading rate um, and in increase this uh, reading uh, rate gradually until the, the patient is able actually to follow any audiobooks as uh, any, anybody else. Uh, that is one free online material that we use in the clinic is the angiosound sound that is specifically developed for uh, deaf uh, people, rehabilitation, and the patient uh, enjoys it because they can score themselves and they know how they are doing. So that is an, um, an example of a log of a patient, uh, 11 years old patient, that created and sent to me, she sent it to me these several two weeks telling me what, she, what are the results that she, has, she is getting. So we can see that, that she, she can see, she can, she can track her down, how she is progressing. Uh, she tells me which are the listening conditions that she is using. So she is in quiet, she is adding noise to the, to the speech signal. And we, I have information how she is doing, I have the information which type of uh, uh, fine tuning I'm going to need to work with her. So to conclude, uh, what we have learned in the last 12 years, uh, which are the critical factors for success, that's uh, what we think, uh, realit realistic expectations, so these patients need to know what they are signing up for, they need uh, to have a very clear message uh, from all the cochlear implant team, from the ENT surgeons, from the audiologists, from the speech pathologists. Uh, we need to deliver a consistent message uh, of, with evidence-based approach, not what we believe, not what we think, but what we have been found uh, in the last few years. Uh, early success it's very important to keep these patients uh, engaged so and we use the approach of uh, rehab rehabilitation target at the level where the patient can act in success so they keep engaged as i said before we use the direct audio input passive learning for these patients uh, do not work so we use the direct input to ensure that the, the the ear implanted is being stimulated on its own. Consistent rehab, I'm not, to, I'm not going to get tired to repeat this, regular and consistent rehab is very important. So the patient from very early on, they are set to fail or set to succeed. So in our uh, center, we always tell them that we celebrate the success and we learn with the, fail the failures because what is not working from them, we need to use that to work together towards a developing a rehab that actually is more useful for them. And that's my message for today. Thank you.